Hello everyone and welcome to the ZIO Meetup London. Uh, this meetup is co-organized in collaboration with Functional World from Poland and Scala Meetup Am Amsterdam. Uh, today, our star of the evening is Piotr Gowembiewski, experienced software consultant, passionate about Scala and functional programming, contributor to Zio. Uh, Piotr, on a day-to-day -day basis, works for Scalac, and Piotr will be speaking today to us about why Scala 3 will be awesome. From here, I also wanted to thank our sponsors, Zyverge uh, and Scala C for making this meetup possible, so thank you for that. Welcome, Piotr, and good luck today. Um, let's let's begin. All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Sandra. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Piotr Kolembiewski, but you're more likely to know me by my nickname, which is Ayolio. As Sandra mentioned, I'm working as a Scala consultant for Scalac, and I'm also a contributor to Zio. And recently I have moved to Ireland. So if you're from Dublin area, hi, I'd love to meet you after the lockdown. So uh, if you'd like to show me your favorite cafe or pub, you will find my contact details on the last slide. And yeah, so I'm very excited about Scala 3. And tonight I will share with you why you should be excited too. But first, uh, I wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here, and especially to Maya and Sandra. You're the best. Thank you very much. And now let's start with a, a quick overview of Scala 3 features. And uh, then we will jump straight into code, where I will show you a side-by-side -side comparison how the same problem can be solved using Scala 2 and Scala 3. And then I will summarize how I think these changes will affect the future of programming in Scala. So after almost a decade of work, Scala 3 is packed with features. Some of them are completely new, while some of them were already present in the Scala 2 ecosystem but were implemented using implicits or macros, which introduced additional complexity and made it harder to use them and understand them. So uh, first of all, there are many new types and each of these is designed to solve a specific use case. For example, with type lambdas, now it's, possibly to, uh, it's possible to partially apply higher kind of types and then the language itself has changed to give first-class support to some common usages and patterns. Like for example, now Scala has its own enum data type, which is much more powerful than its Java counterpart uh, because basically it allows for parameterized cases. And by doing so, it can model uh, even enumerations with uh, an infinite set of values. And uh, there are a lot of smaller changes and improvements, and not to mention all the new tools for metaprogramming, like uh, inline or, or macros, and uh, of course, tasty. So now let's take a closer look and just let me switch to my ID. All right. So as a warm up, let's compare the different ways we can run our application. So in Scala 2, what we can do is we can have an object and it all is required to have a main class, a uh, main method, uh, and the body of the method is basically our program and we can run that. And there is also uh, a utility trait uh, that basically allows us to hide this uh, uh, this pattern uh, within the trade. So basically the body of the object itself becomes the body of the main method. And yeah, so we can also have some uh, default arguments like here. And since these are just regular objects, we can also create programs that run other programs like here. So now 
in Scala 3, we don't need these objects. In Scala 3, we can add the at main annotation to basically any statically available uh, method, and it will become uh, the main method for our program. And notice that here we also uh, uh, give the uh, arguments as an array of string, and here it's just a var. And let me just run this. Yeah, okay, it had to compile. And also, what we get in Scala 3 is uh, so we can define arguments of different types than string. So we can have an argument that takes a type of Boolean, then another argument of type int, and followed by some other arguments. And to demonstrate that, to demonstrate that, we can run this and then just copy this over here. So here I'm uh, running this Scala free project and uh, I'm running the class in Scala running package. So this is the package over here and the name of the class uh, uh, of the, the main class is basically the name of the method. And then I provide the arguments. So when I run this, you see Scala has automatically parsed for me these uh, Boolean and int values and it ran uh, without problems. Okay, I see there are some comments that you cannot see uh, the mouse. Yes, it's Visual Studio Code. And uh, I don't know if I can do something about the mouse, but yeah, I'll try to just maybe uh, highlight things this way. Okay, so now, uh, of course, we can have some main methods that just take no arguments. In this case, we just can return simple unit and get have no parameter lists. And this will also run just fine. And similarly to how in Scala 2, these are just regular methods. So we can call them from other main methods and this will also run very well. But in Scala 3, we also get some uh, nice stuff. So for example, if I define some custom uh, model here, Fubarbas, which has just three cases, uh, I can use this uh, predefined um, from string uh, type class. And if I provide an instance of this type class for my type in the scope, then I will be able, the Scala will be able to automatically pass any input arguments to this uh, type. And we can demonstrate that by running this snippet. Right. And by the way, uh, here in the implementation, I'm using the value of method, which is automatically generated for any enumeration that has all the cases as singleton objects. So, and then uh, it will just pass the string to the uh, string representation uh, of the object. All right, let's run this. And as you can see, it runs successfully. Okay, now in the next example, uh, we will have a look at error handling. So we deal with errors every day and practically every input has to be somehow validated. And whether it's parsing or looking up a record in a database, we have to deal with the failure paths. So what we usually do is we encode these into values and delegate the handling of the error to the caller. So here we have an example of a simple, um, um, uh, so we have an example of uh, some domain specific errors. And um, here we have some functions that either return some value or they return uh, one of these errors. And then, an example program here, uh, which uh, combines these functions to calculate some output. But there is a problem here. So if we look at the type that is inferred here, and I hope you can see uh, it, it says output is of type either domain error or double. So 
uh, we can see that this error, which here was non-numeric input and here was division by zero, it got widened to the uh, lowest common supertype, which in this case is this domain error trait. And the problem is, so we know that this program can fail only in two ways. The problem is if I commented out this case here, Scala would complain that this pattern matching is not exhaustive. It would complain that uh, it would fail on the input of negative input, uh, but we know that this can never happen, this problem. So one way of solving that would be, for example, adding this default case here, uh, which will never be called at runtime. But this is problematic because sometime in the future, uh, someone might add another case. So someone might uh, expand this program and have here result two, which is, for example, result to end, and then let's return result two. And now the problem is here, we did not handle the case of negative input, which now can happen. And if the programmer who introduced this change forgot that somewhere else he has to add this uh, update, this handler, well, then we have a, a bug in our code and this will blow up at runtime. So this, this is an issue. Now uh, let's um, consider the uh, equivalent scenario in Scala 3. And here we will replace uh, either with our custom or data type. So uh, as you can see here, we did not have to uh, introduce the uh, catch all case. And the compiler knows that these two errors are the only possible, but how does it know it? Well, let's look at the inferred type here. And the inferred type for the error path here is non-numeric input or the division by zero. So this is one of the new types that Scala 3 gives us. This is a union type. And the, what it does is basically the way it reads. So it can be either uh, the first case or the second case. And now if someone were to introduce a similar change uh, to this code base, well then, uh, and we don't need that in Scala free syntax, then the compiler will automatically here uh, notify us that there is a new uh, error case that is not handled. So we will get this information. And uh, we can see here in the inferred type, the uh, now it is a non-numeric input or division by zero or negative input. Right. Uh, okay, and uh, well, how is it achieved? Well, I, I cheated here a little. I created my own data type, which mimics the either data type. Uh, I just implemented the flat mat and map for the for comprehension to work and the fold that I'm using over here. Uh, the only change that I introduced here is that uh, instead of uh, returning the uh, requiring that uh, the error types, uh, they have some common super type. I'm, I don't care if they are, if have anything in common, I just return the, uh, the union for errors here. And, and this works well and it infers very well. Okay, now let's move on to the next example. Okay, so uh, when modeling our business domain, we want to create new types to be able to constrain our code such that one cannot accidentally pass invalid values. One way of doing that is to wrap our types in case classes. And often the base types are too forgiving. So uh, to prevent the creation of invalid values, we make the case class final, and we also mark the primary constructor as private, while at the same time providing the so-called uh, smart constructors in the companion object. Now, from 
the fact that it is a case class, we get uh, uh, some nice auto-generated methods for equals or hash code for free. However, this will also auto-generate apply and copy methods, which unfortunately will be public. So, uh, so this is an example how uh, we can use the smart constructor to construct uh, values. And in case of failure, we get a none. And in case of success, we get uh, some. But unfortunately, the problem is here that we can use also this apply method to directly construct an invalid value, or we can use an existing object and use the copy method and also create this way an invalid value. And now this has been somehow uh, fixed by adding the abstract modifier here. And what this makes uh, in Scala 2 is that the copy and apply methods will not no longer be generated. And then of course, you since this is an abstract class, then you also have to, um, uh, when you call, want to construct it, you have to add these braces here. And then of course, in some legitimate cases, you no longer, there is no copy method anymore. So you have to manually uh, construct it uh, from scratch every time. Uh, so yeah, so now, as I said, the apply method and the copy methods, they no longer exist and uh, problem solved, right? Now let's compare that to how it looks in Scala 3. So basically the equivalent encoding for that, and let's just scroll up. Uh, in Scala 3, we don't have to introduce this abstract uh, modifier. Basically, just by setting the primary constructor private, the copy and apply method, they will be auto-generated, but they will be private also. So we can use them in the context of our companion object, but we cannot use them anywhere else. So in general, Scala 3 behaves out of the box the way we would expect it to. Now, uh, and now let's say that uh, we, are, we have this um, application and we're following the even sourcing pattern. So we might have some domain specific types here, just like uh, this email type or user ID, which are underneath backed by uh, string and UOID. And then we have also some smart constructors with validation. And we also applied this pattern just to make sure there are no uh, workarounds to, to create invalid values. And then we might have also some commands and events uh, defined as these uh, seal traits here. So now let's have a look uh, uh, how this would look like in Scala 3. And so this is the equivalent code. And first of all, uh, what you can note is here is that uh, there will be no runtime overhead because the email type in Scala 3 is just, this is just a type alias to string. While here we had to box the value uh, to, to create a new type for it. Of course, there are some libraries and some uh, uh, workarounds to also do it without runtime overhead, but I'm comparing here like plain Scala 2 to plain Scala 3. Um, so uh, uh, in this case, uh, also outside of the context, of this companion object, the Scala compiler has no idea that an email is a string. It just, it's just a sum type and it doesn't know anything about its structure. But inside of this companion object, Scala is aware that email is actually a string. So over here, when we have the validation passed, we can just pass this V value, which is of type string, and this will compile and we can return it as an option of email. While outside of this context, if we try to, we have this case, for example, the sign up and uh, it requires uh, a type of email. So uh, we can pass it an email type, no problem. But uh, if we try to pass it just a regular string and let's give the compiler a moment to actually compile this. Yeah, so we see, it doesn't know that an email is a string. 
So this is very nice. It allows us to constrain and control what and where is visible uh, to the compiler. And also notice how much more verbose this code on the left is and how much thinner and lighter is the code on the right. So here we have like, for, for the same thing here, we just have the case uh, um, keyword while here we have to have uh, three keywords and then extend explicitly. And this is the equivalent. So, uh, so Scala free is just, less verbose and less noisy and much easier to read. And um, yeah, okay. Now let's move on to the next example. Okay, so let's say we wanted to build some domain specific language, for example, to to just build some uh, HTML snippets. And on the use side, we would like it to resemble HTML as closely as possible. So we might want it to look somehow like this, right? And in the end, this page uh, will be some string. And we can also run this and uh, see how this would be rendered. Okay, so in Scala 2, you could encode that by creating an HTML data structure. And uh, so what it has is, of course, every element of HTML has some label, and then it can contain some uh, children, some uh, nested HTML elements. And, uh, and we also need some way of rendering this element. And the way we would do that is, uh, uh, we will do that uh, in context of some string builder. So we're building a string and we want to do it efficiently with a string builder. And the way we would render this element is we render first the, the opening tag, then we render all of the children if there are any, and we also render them with one level more of indentation. And then finally we close with the closing tag. And then, uh, uh, in the companion object, we could create some uh, specialized uh, uh, cases for that. So for the P element, B, H1, and div. And of course, for, for row text, we have to override this render method because uh, in HTML, row text is not, uh, uh, is not uh, wrapped in any tag. It's just rendered as is. And then we could have this uh, uh, function uh, HTML, which is actually creating the, the context in which this whole structure lives. Uh, so it's creating this implicit string builder and uh, it's uh, creating the opening and closing tag and uh, starting the whole process of rendering this and finally returning the string. And in here, uh, we just have some uh, uh, implicit conversion and this is just from string to our text node. So we can just use raw strings here, uh, so it looks uh, better. Okay, so um, so the same thing uh, in Scala three uh, can be achieved without using these uh, uh, these uh, rubber objects. So uh, and of course, uh, in general, it is a good idea to represent such things as structures as structures can be inspected and transformed. But just for this case, for, for, for this uh, demonstration, let's say we all we care about is the final HTML string. So all of these uh, uh, objects that are created uh, uh, in Scala 2, they are just overhead for us. But unfortunately, they are necessary because uh, we cannot have uh, uh, an uh, implicit parameter in a regular function in Scala 3, we can have implicit parameters only on methods. So now, uh, so the equivalent in Scala 3 would use the uh, context functions. So this context function, we, we could create this uh, type alias and uh, this parameter list by using this question mark arrow, we tell the compiler that we want the preceding parameter list to be uh, implicit. We want it to be provided implicitly. And then uh, we could uh, uh, 
create this uh, rendering logic, which is similar to what we have here on the left-hand side. And then we could create these cases, but this time without any objects, we could have them just as regular methods and uh, uh, just delegate the implementation to this uh, uh, utility method. And then similarly uh, for, for text, we have some special case where we don't uh, use this. We just render the, the value of the text and similar um, uh, the, this uh, starting um, uh, method HTML, it also is creating, in this case, given, given is the equivalent of implicit value uh, in uh, Scala 3. Uh, so we're creating a given string builder. Uh, also here, I'm implicitly requiring the indentation level. So I'm creating here uh, uh, also a given for that. And these two parameters will be automatically injected to, uh, to the uh, applying of every uh, of every HTML node uh, inside. And then also, just like on the left-hand side, we have some uh, conversion, uh, implicit conversion from string to HTML. Uh, for the same reasons, we just want this to uh, be nicely can use, so we can use string literals in our DSL. Okay, now one thing to note here uh, is, uh, when I tried to just use a regular uh, type address, which I assumed would work, but this happened. Like for some reason, uh, this value got uh, basically discarded and this is what this uh, uh, error is coming from. Uh, and for some reason, this uh, conversion did not kick in. Uh, so I'm not sure why that is, but again, if I just use this, a uh, new construct of opaque type alias, I just hide the fact what it is inside that it's some function that requires some implicit whatever. I hide this all uh, from the Scala compiler outside of this companion object context. And uh, so here, and let me maybe uh, reset the build server. This sometimes happens uh, with VS Code. Uh, the tooling still could be uh, a little improved for Scala 3. Uh, as soon as I get some uh, uh, parsing error, then uh, they stay, they tend to stay. Okay. Uh, and of course, uh, it would be nice to have something like that. And let me just comment this. So in here, it would be nice if I could just also uh, say that I want this parameter list to be of type varargs. So then I could uh, basically make all of these just simple values. Uh, however, uh, this is not yet supported. Uh, uh, and I don't know if it will be. Uh, so yeah, this is on my wish list. Mm. And okay, so, uh, so now we can also expand on this uh, example a little bit. So we can also create some other opaque type aliases. And I have said before that this opaque type alias, it's hiding from the compiler the fact what this actually is. However, uh, we can leak some information out by using type constraints. We can, well, in here, the compiler will not know what P is exactly. It will not know that it is this implicit string builder and end to unit uh, function. But what it will know that it is a subtype of this HTML type. And this allows me to uh, constrain a little bit this DSL. So I can, using the union types, again, very useful tool. Uh, I can say that, for example, the P element, it only uh, accepts text node or B nodes. And of course, if I remove that and uh, compile that, then it will complain over here that this B is not allowed. Yeah. And uh, let me refer. Okay. Now let's move on to the next example. So, Sometimes we have to use some external library or code that we have no control over. 
but we would like to be able to extend the available API. So in Scala 2, we had the so-called pin my library pattern for that. And what it was in short is that when we called a non-existing method on some type, so for example, type int does not have a kilometer method defined on it, uh, the compiler will look for an implicit conversion into some other type that does have a matching method. And it will then, per, if, the, if it finds such conversion and it's a unique hit, it will perform the conversion silently for us and this will compile. So to encode this uh, in Scala 2, uh, we create a wrapper class. So something like double ops uh, with our uh, desired operations. And this wrapper would wrap, uh, would have to just take single argument in its constructor of the type that we want to extend. So double ops wrapper extends the double type with these methods. And, um, and, and then we had to also define an implicit converter, uh, implicit conversion that will, uh, uh, that will wrap our double into this wrapper. And similar from, for uh, the length ops. So now, this allows us to actually use these dot kilometers, meters, and centimeters operation on, 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 this, uh, uh, on these types. And here, these are actually ints that are uh, upcasted to, uh, to double. And, uh, and uh, of course, these plus or minus operations, they are also uh, defined. This, these, all of these return the type of quantity. And here, I'm extending the quantity with these uh, operations. And so this pattern was so popular in Scala 2 that it later got a special uh, shorter syntax. So uh, it looked like this. So in here, basically, this implicit class, uh, this is basically the wrapper object and the implicit conversion in one go. Um, OK, so now let's have a look how uh, similar things can be achieved in Scala 3. And so in Scala 3, we're just getting this new keyword called extension. And if I align this right, maybe, or something like that. So you can see that this extension corresponds directly to this implicit class. And it does the same thing. So, but it is nicer because this mechanism gets its own keyword. It's its own thing. It's not conflated with other concepts, such as implicit conversions or uh, implicit parameters and other things. So now, uh, and then in, inside of the scope, we can define the uh, methods that uh, uh, will be available on this extended type. And also here, I'm demonstrating also some new nice feature. We have this target name annotation with which we can basically uh, create aliases for the method. So um, this, uh, millimeter uh, method will actually in the byte code it will be called millimeters and every time we call uh, we we use the shorthand version uh, in the byte code it will actually be the longer version okay and a similar thing for for this uh, quantity uh, length okay now let's move on to the last example uh, so in Scala 2 we also had this very useful tool uh, called type classes, which allowed us to um, basically encode some generic behaviors for any data types without using inheritance. So let's say we have some uh, data types, and then we want to uh, enhance them with some uh, functionality. And in this case, I'm just uh, using here, uh, just calling the dot show on this taxi driver object. But of course, uh, we could use it in a generic function uh, like uh, sorting or a generic list or whatever. So, uh, so the way we would encode that in Scala 2 is we would create this trait and then some uh, implicit, uh, uh, implicit uh, wrapper for this nice syntax. Um, and then we could have in the companion object some prepackaged instances for this type class. Uh, defined, but we could also uh, somewhere else in our code, we could define our own instances. 
And we could even derive our instances from some other instances. So in this case, we will be giving the compiler a show for a taxi driver, but to do that, we have to use, uh, we have to have in the context a show of person and, uh, and uh, a show uh, of uh, car. And the usage would look something like this. And now a similar thing in Scala 3. So in Scala 3, the usage is exactly the same. Uh, however, on the definition side, if I just align it right, you can see that here, this is the type class definition. And this is also the, uh, the syntax. Uh, the, this also gives this nice syntax because we're using the, we're defining this show method as an extension method. So it's using also uh, this, uh, uh, these uh, extension methods that I showed in, in the previous uh, example, this syntax, right? Uh, so, uh, so these two lines achieves the same as these, what is it, seven lines? Uh, so basically uh, on a given type, if you have give a given instance for some A type of this type class, you can call just dot show on that type, uh, just like here, right? Dot show. And then of course, similarly, you could have hidden in the companion object of the type class, you could have some prepackaged show instances for some types. So usually what would be prepackaged would be show in, uh, would be instances of a type class for uh, you know the basic types like string, boolean, etc. And then you would have also maybe some uh, uh, deriv derive, uh, derivation logic to derive, uh, for example, for any uh, product type or, or for uh, some types. Okay. Uh, and of course, you could also do the same thing as here. So somewhere else in your program, uh, well, let's say this is part of some library. This is some code you, not, you do not control. And this is the part that you actually control. So you can actually define your own instances. Uh, and this is the new syntax. So how it reads is uh, you are giving to the compiler uh, a show of taxi driver. So the thing that you're ascribing here. And to do that, you need to use the uh, instances of show for person and car. So the full syntax here is actually, we can have with name. So let's say it's a show taxi driver. So, uh, so this is the full syntax, but you don't need this name, you can omit it. This is just for some uh, cases where you would like to explicitly uh, uh, refer to this by name. Uh, so, and this is really nice actually, like if you look at the full syntax, it almost looks like a method definition. Let's say like given show uh, driver, let's say, and then we have only one implicit parameter list. So show one, show, person and then show to show car and by the by the way in Scala 3 this implicit uh, this old implicit syntax is still available because we're in the transition period so uh, but this uh, these givens actually are underneath uh, 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 backed by actual implicits and then okay let's uh, continue with the example so and we're giving the show of taxi driver and then equals and some implementation. Like you can see that this syntax is basically the same. And also, of course, we could have here names show one and show two. Like I've just skipped those because I don't need those. Uh, as long as this instance is in the scope, I can just call dot show. I don't need this name here. But the full syntax looks like this. So uh, yeah, let me just point that out so that it's still compiled. All right. So that's all of the examples that I have for now. Let me switch to the presentation. And uh, yeah. OK. So to summarize, I think Scala 3 is going to be awesome. The language is much more expressive. 
It provides us with more tools to encode our intent and it has better type inference. Uh, the syntax is much more concise and less noisy and it has carefully chosen keywords. So it's simply clear and readable. And finally, there have been many very, many very useful and common patterns now have received um, first class language support. So overall, you might think this is not a big deal, but I think in the end, um, uh, well, you know, we get used to, we can get used to any syntax, right? So some may think like it's not a big deal, but I believe this actually, this less visual noise, uh, better type inference, and this first class language support for, for some uh, very important patterns, uh, this will have a huge positive impact on our everyday work as developers. And this will lower the entry barrier for new people coming into the community it will make some of these tools like type classes, like extension methods, much more accessible to a wider uh, range of developers. So in the end, and also uh, there are many tools I have not covered here, like uh, the, uh, the macros uh, and, other, and inlining and, uh, uh, and all of the other uh, new types that I have not covered. And I'm just uh, curious to see uh, how uh, the community will use these new tools and build some awesome APIs and libraries on top of that. And yeah. So uh, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm tweeting at, uh, at IOLEO underscore. And I'm also blogging uh, sometimes uh, on our company blog. Uh, so go visit skalak.io slash blog. You can chat directly with me on Zio Discord. Uh, and if you want to dive deeper with me, uh, you, I invite you to, to register for the Scala free workshops uh, that are licensed by Zyverge and were originally created by John de Goss and now are uh, organized by Scala and I will be uh, teaching them. So the next one is on the 25th and 26th of February and I think there will be two more in March. And that's all. Thank you very much.